Friends, how you doing? Normally I'd say a thing around, around this point about how I could play that particular backing track forever, but that is not a backing track. That's a song. Because here, dear friends, we get to talk about songs. Hi, how you doing? My name is Nick Jennison. It's the Monday Guitar Show. The main camera is out of focus, but that's something we can fix. Hey, that's much better. How you doing? Thanks for joining us. This is the Monday Guitar Show brought to you by Lick Library. Guitar Interactive Magazine, and our friends at Orally Sound, who were providing not the backing track for this song, not the stems for this song, but the device by which I was playing them back. This is an app called Songmaster Pro. We'll talk about that in a little bit. If you're new here, hi, thanks for coming. If you're a returning friend, hi, thanks for coming back. Today, we are discussing how you can learn songs in the most effective and most efficient way possible. This has been on my mind for a little while, because I've got, well, first of all, we had a bunch of questions about this over a few previous streams. Also, I have the task of learning a whole bunch of songs uh, in the not too distant future for a run of shows that I've got coming up in the summer. I do this every year. Uh, we end up learning something like three hours of material. I'm quite a busy person, uh, as I'm sure you are too. Um, I don't have all the time in the world to sit and learn songs. So it's in my interest to be able to learn them effectively, efficiently, but also to a standard that I can perform them and get paid for it. Um, so here's what we're doing today. If you are new to what we're doing on these shows, if it's your first time watching, hi, thanks for coming on board. We do this every Monday. We do an educational stream here on whichever YouTube channel you happen to be watching on, whether it's Lick Library, whether it's Guitar Interactive Magazine, or wherever, or on the Facebook, or wherever else you happen to be watching. The guitar is making noise to let us know that it's here. Um, we do a stream every Monday where we do some educational stuff about all manner of things, technique, theory, uh, song learning, you name it. Today, the discussion is turned to song learning because there were some questions about it. So we're going to be getting into that today. Hopefully, we'll be equipping you with some tools that you can use to learn songs very efficiently, very effectively. Before we do that, just want to take a quick second and shout out what I think is the best resource for learning songs, which is this guy right here, licklibrary.com. If you want lessons, we have an unbelievable quantity of lessons over at Lick Library where you can go and learn just about every song you're ever going to want to, including full-length classic albums. I think we're up into the 60s as far as classic albums, not decades, but numbers of albums that we've done. It's crazy and there's more coming. But anyway, let's get into the meat of today's session in just a second. Before we do, let's say hello to the folks in the stream. First of all, Marcin is the first one in the house. Marcin, it's great to see you. Uh, he's been playing 
Oh, couple of great guitars. Here we go. A Gibson R0 and a PRS DGT Gold Top. Uh, very nice. Uh, the LP was cool, but the DGT was a real singer. A magic guitar. I told my friend to keep it. Well, you know what? Like, maybe tell your friend... Not to keep it, but to give it to you, uh, because they are fantastic guitars. Friend of mine, Ainsley, um, really fine, fine, fine guitar player, great touch, lovely player, very self-deprecating and shouldn't be really. He's a great, great guitar player, has a gold top DGT that I'm very envious about because it started to come to bits in the best possible way. It started to, um, what's the word, the top has started to uh, age and become uh, kind of beaten up. It looks absolutely fantastic, but those DGTs are killer. They're some of my favorite off-the-shelf PRS. Uh, you you guys who are regular viewers of our stream will know that I am a big fan of huge frets and that's one of the defining factors of the DGT. The DGT has enormous whopping great frets, just humongous ones and I happen to really really like that. So yeah, huge frets on the DGT, we're a fan of that, pickups are great too. I like the two volumes thing. Um, yeah, nothing else to love there. Great guitar, of course. We also uh, had the fortune of going down to the Gibson Garage uh, recently uh, with Guitar Interactive magazine where we also played some beautiful Gibson guitars. I even have a nice Gibson guitar hanging out with me today. This is uh, my friend John's 335 that I won't show you because it's tuned B standard. We also have his Telecaster kicking around here. Thanks, John. Uh, it's in... <laughs> Uh, the tweed case which is behind me uh so yeah cool guitars man larry warren is in the house larry lovely to see you uh, response audio is here hope you're having a, a great monday last week i hurt my neck oh man i'm sorry to hear that that sucks i don't know i'm grabbing my head so everything is a bit of a struggle neck pain is the worst i'll tell you a little story about that before we go uh, on too far I remember one time, uh, funnily enough, actually, my buddy John, who I play in the band with, our first gig together, uh, way back in 2000 and, well, I can go with the phrase, 2008, a um, long time ago, um, I woke up three days before the gig with my neck frozen in place, and it was frozen in place over this way, which I'm sure you can imagine, I couldn't turn it any further than this, and I'm sure you can imagine that was just fantastic for playing the guitar, because the guitar is all the way over here, uh, so yeah, man, I feel you, it always sucks, but these things do resolve themselves, hopefully you'll be feeling better very very soon rest up do the best that you can uh, and if it hurts don't be afraid to sit it out anyway uh who else do we have pj is in the house pj great to see you timothy appling is here our countries are indeed back in sync it's daylight saving time british summertime here we have for one full day of summer up here in the uk which was yesterday uh it was a beautiful gorgeous easter sunday and now here on bank all day monday it's wet and miserable and freezing cold uh suntanu official uh is asking would you suggest PRS Tremolo or Floyd Rose, which one is better? That's a subject for discussion. I'd like to know from you guys in the comments which one you prefer. We're going to address that in the Q&A section. It's a very good question. I'm going to star that up for later on. Sacred God Slayer is here. Uh, who else do we have in the house? Kate Strange is in the house. Helmet Strap is here. Uh, Timothy Appling is uh, saying, good combination. Get your caffeine fix and guitar fix all in one place. Oh, that must be in reference to the shop uh, that uh, Armacine tried his guitar in. Guitar shops with caffeine they meet with my approval. But anyway, with caffeine meets my approval. It is uh, my drug of choice and I drink quite a lot of coffee. So who else do we have in the house? Let's see. Cranky Tom is in the house. Belated Happy Easter and to you, my man. Hope you had lots of eggs. I am even dressed in Easter egg brown today. Uh, Mike Seedorf is in the house. Mike, it's lovely to see you. Block 18 is here. Uh, Dead Man Doogie Van Dugerson is here. Uh, got some... Uh, Ran here in the oh rain here I'm guessing in the desert wow fantastic okay that's uh we have an abundance of rain I will swap you for some sunshine uh who else do we have uh Paco Jazz Torres Nick why do you always look so angry in your promo photos it is my allotted time to be angry I'm never angry any of the rest of the time so I might as well be angry in promo photos I get told off for making funny uh, faces or not making funny faces. When I play on these streams, I get a lot of um, flack from some folks for looking bored while I'm doing the. Um, the intro and outro jams nothing could be further from the truth i'm reading the comments while i'm doing the intro jams and trying to run a stream so i'm in like full concentration face i have like um you know some people have resting uh i don't know like resting b face or whatever you want to call it uh you know we don't use those terms around here but still um yeah i have like resting boredom face apparently this is the face I make when I'm playing the guitar. Uh, I really should gurn more, but then Frank Gambale said that too. But yeah, I'm not sure, man. I uh, don't know what to tell you. Normally these promo photos are taken for bands where it's appropriate to look angry. Maybe I need some Lick Library specific ones where I'm going like, 
Hey, I don't know. Maybe that'll make a good thumbnail. Who knows? <laughs> Mark McNish is here. Uh, hello, everyone. So much great teaching content, Lick Library. Might need a one on one just to get my head around it. That's a very good chat, man. For any of you guys who are wondering about Lick Library, uh, if you remember, if you're a Lick Library member, um, you can still partake in these streams. Don't worry, these streams are here for you, whether you're a member or whether you're not. We're just happy to have you on board. But if you're a Lick Library member, don't member, don't forget you get one-to-one -one lessons uh, with our man Stuart Shields, um, who is there not just to help you with the guitar playing, but also to guide you around the mammoth Library of Alexandria of guitar lessons that is Lick Library. So yeah, you should book one, man. Don't be afraid, book one. It's free. It's included in the membership. Uh, and Stu's a really, really, uh, really lovely guy. Uh, Timothy Appling says, uh, nice guitar sense today, Nick. Thanks, man. Um, it's these P90s. They absolutely rock. This is a fan favorite with good reason. Let's see who else we have. Mustache Metal is here. Fabulous to have you on board. Uh, John McGuigan is in the house. Uh, who else do we have? Our friend Paolo Cesar JD is tuning in from Veracruz, Mexico. Lovely to have you on board. Uh, Egyptian Neck Gig <laughs> said Sacred God Slayer in reference to my uh, neck incident. Yeah, not a fan, not a fan of that. Um, but you know, it's one of these things. Uh, Tom Man FFS is in the house. It's good to have you, man. I think first time commenter, certainly on my streams. It's lovely to have you on board. Uh, Ron Stein is tuning in from Texas. Ron, it's great to see you. Another first time commenter. And we also have a vote from John Mack for the PRS Tremolo with regards to the Tremolo debate. Now we'll get into the Tremolo debate as like an undercurrent of what we've got going on today. So uh, we'll be talking about learning songs but don't forget don't forget we are trying to figure out for our friend uh sun tanu official uh i just realized that's like sun tan sun tanu official um which i could do with let me tell you um we're trying to work out whether a uh, prs tremolo or a floyd rose is superior my vote goes controversially to the floyd rose uh, now, the reason for this, now you guys know them a PRS artist. I love PRS trams, they are fabulous. If I had the choice of the two, I'd probably choose a Floyd just because once they're in, they're in. And I'm quite handy at setting up Floyds. I've played Floyds for years. You'll have seen my, uh, is it, can I get some camera? Who knows? You'll have seen, it's not really a Floyd, but you've seen this white guitar. Uh, I'll bring that out later because it's threatening to come off its stand. Uh, that is my white Ibanez RG550 from 1989, I want to say. It's an old guitar. Um, got a low pro edge on it. Um, oh, there we go. It's not even a low pro. It's just an edge, an original edge. Uh, PJ has uh, some love for the uh, low pro edge. Sure. I'm quite handy setting them up. However, what I will say is if you don't know how to set up a Floyd, go get a PRS tram. They're like 90% of the way there in terms of the, the things that they can do. The tuning stability is also rock solid. Absolutely rock solid. For me, I think there's something about a Floyd. If you're going to go down the tram road, you might as well go two feet in. So I like Floyds. Should pick up one of those PRS with Floyd one day, really, because they're super cool. Anyway, we're going to get into the meat of today's session, which is how you can learn songs effectively and efficiently. But to do this, I want to take a second and show some love to today's sponsor, which is our friends at Orally Sound. Now, this little app that you're looking at here is Orally Sound Songmaster Pro. Now, this is the app that these guys make that is magic for learning songs. Absolutely wonderful, which is the reason we've chosen to address this particular topic today. Now, what you'll see here is that I have taken this particular song that I've brought in. This is a song by a band I'm working with called Crowley that I'll tell you about a little bit later on. Uh, I have taken this into Songmaster Pro where I've been able to take away Lydia's absolutely stunning vocals. We'll just bring that back to the start. I'll show you what's going on here. So this app, you load an audio file into it. It generates stems for you. So you can isolate the individual parts of the song. You can transpose the song. You can speed it up and slow it down. You can loop different sections. It tells you the chords, which is really super cool. Uh, it's got a bunch of other tools that we can use that we're gonna make some use of today when it comes to learning our songs. You do not need this app, I should point this out. You do not need this app to get the best out of today's lesson. It's just a cool app that you might like to use if you're after this sort of thing. Now, let me show you what's going on here. So in terms of stems, here's the full song. Absolutely stellar, I'm sure you can agree. But let's say we're learning this song and we are distracted by how good those vocals are. Well, what if we turn them off? Huh. That's pretty cool. What if we decided we wanted to turn off the guitar? So we could just play with some 
bass and drums. What if we don't like the drums? What if we just want the guitar on its own? Absolute wizardry. If you told me that, like, <laughs> I don't know, even just a couple of years ago, if you told me this was a thing that we'd been able to do. I remember having this conversation with some production students where it was like, um, <laughs> the question was, they were asking if they could uh, take a song that had been mixed by a friend and turn up the vocals. And I'm like, mm, not really. Or you remove the guitar with EQ. And I'm like, no, you can't do that. And I used the analogy of, uh, of a cake. And I said, if you took a cake and you, it's a bit like you've come to me, dear past student, whose name I will not mention because we don't name names here. And ultimately they turned out to be right. Um, thanks, already sound. Uh, <laughs> I brought the analogy of like, they've brought me a cake and they've asked me, hey, listen, can you just uh, take the eggs out of this cake? I'm like, no, it's a cake. The cake is finished. It's just a cake. You can't go in and remove all the eggs from the cake once the cake has been baked. But uh, apparently, thanks to Arrowly Sound, you can. Now, anyway, let's get onto the subject of today's lesson, which is learning songs. So, learning songs, how do we do it? How do we do it quickly? How do we do it most efficiently? I'm going to guide you through my process for this, uh, because I've got a bunch of them to do. And the song in question that we're going to take a look at learning today, we're going to do this together, is a song by the band Crowley, who uh, I've been doing some production for. Uh, they're a fantastic band. We've got some new singles coming out uh, in the uh, coming weeks, I think. There's one coming, there's a follow-up coming. I can't tell you too much about that, because uh, we're on NDAs. But this one is out. This is a song called Pyre, that you can go and check out on... Uh, uh, wherever you go and listen to music, uh, they're fantastic. And long-term viewers of Lick Library, or even recent-term viewers of Lick Library, will know the guitar player from Crowley as our very own Eliza Lee, who is uh, doing all the little short videos, doing the monthly roundups. So you've met Eliza already. This is the band, uh, and this is the song Pyre. Now, this is an interesting case, because this is a song that I'm going to use as a case study for... A song where there is no tab existing, there is no lessons existing. It's just a song that a cool band have put out and I want to learn. So this removes the obvious choices from us. The obvious choice is let's go somewhere and get the tab. I have a question for you. Have you ever been on the wrong end of this? Where you've gone and gotten some tab and you've learned something and it's been wrong forever because you learned it from the tab, right? I have done this thousands of times and there are parts of songs that I have the wrong memory of now. I've memorized the tab that I learned which was wrong uh, as opposed to learning the actual song. So tab we'll talk about. Tab is useful. I'm not demonizing the tab thing. I don't feel like it's something that's bad but it needs to be put into context. The other better option in my opinion is if there is a lesson for that song go get that lesson. Go watch someone teach you. Uh, case in point if I try to tab you a very challenging and difficult line, let's say, let's say, for example, I wanted to tab you, maybe not a difficult line, but a line that's quite complicated, let's say. Let's say, for example, I wanted to uh, teach you this line very quickly. Let's say a line that went like this. To learn that line from tab would be quite a slow process but what I can do so I can do the following we'll try this together friends so I'm gonna go like this I am gonna go well let's first of all take a look at what we're playing here we're playing a scale line we have six notes in each string I'll tell you what the sequence is in a bit but the notes in each string to begin with are three five and seven on the lowest string we're gonna play three seven five three five seven the pattern might be low high middle low middle high there's the pattern we're going to play that pattern on the low E string on 3, 5, and 7. We'll move to the A string, same pattern, but this time on 4, 5, and 7. 4, 5, and 7 again on the D string, so the first three strings of this. Next up, we have 4, 6, and 7, 5, 7, and 8, 5, 7, and 9. Same pattern again on the highest three strings, like this. Finish on 10. Put it together like this. Piece of cake. That is something that if I tried to tab out for you and present it to you as tab, would have taken much longer than that to learn. Now, this is why video lessons are, are, are great and why lessons in person are better again. Um, I think all of them again, you know, if you have a great teacher that you want to reach out to over video, let the guys over at Lick Library. You know where to go. So I'm going to stop shilling the library right now because I, just, 
what the lick library? What am I going to say? What do you want me to say? Anyway, um, but yeah, that's one of the arguments for video lessons or the arguments uh, against tab learning. Not only did that uh, go by very quickly, but it also conferred rhythmic value. It conferred meaning. We learned a scale shape. We learned a sequence that we can then think of when we play this song, as opposed to thinking about individual notes. It's an important step. So. Tab aside, because we don't have tab for our cool song that we're learning today, we don't have a lesson for the cool song that we're learning today, what are our options? Well, we learn it by ear. We do it the old fashioned way, the way uh, our ancestors intended. And the best way we do this, the best way we do this is, you guessed it, by listening. Now, when we listen to songs, this is step number one, when you listen to songs, it's very important to create a very solid mental image of what the song sounds like. What does the song sound like? This is true, not just for learning songs, but it's true for every guitar playing endeavor that we undertake. We have to have a clear image of the thing that we're trying to play and what it's supposed to sound like. I'm gonna ask you a question on this. I'm gonna ask you to sing in your head, sing in your head, the riff from Smoke on the Water. We've heard this thousands of times. If you don't know what the riff from Smoke on the Water goes like, first of all, you're very young, uh, and I'm envious of you. Uh, or, you know, maybe you're not, who knows. Uh, if you don't know Smoke on the Water, substitute for Seven Nation Army or whatever song of your choice, that's fine, right? But sing in your head the song Smoke on the Water. I'm willing to bet that you can probably conjure a really very, very, very clear mental image of what the song is gonna sound like. And when I play this, Despite the fact that I'm playing it in G sharp rather than G, it sounds kind of right. But if I play this. There you go. That's not it. Now, that would be tabbed very much the same as the first version because the rhythmic information, the inflection, the dynamics, not conveyed in written, in, in a tablature rendition of a song. So what, how do we get a listen, how do we get a mental image of a song by listening? How do we figure out what it sounds like? Well, we listen and we listen all the way through. And what do we do while we listen? Do we just listen? No, we listen and we take mental notes. What are we gonna do when we're taking mental notes? Well, our first objective, our first objective as we go through our song for the first time is to pay attention to things like structure, i.e. when are the verses and choruses? How many verses and choruses are there? Are there verses? Are there choruses? How long are they? Do they repeat? How many times do they repeat? Uh, is it like Don't Stop Believing where the chorus doesn't come in until the very end? Or is it something like She Loves You where the song comes in with the chorus? What's the deal there? Are there any key changes? What is the key of the song? I have a question for you guys and we're gonna play this through. I want to know from you in the comments, what key is this song in? This song is Pyre by Crowley. Let's take a listen. We're gonna listen through. We're gonna throw the Songmaster Pro app on the screen. I'm gonna show you my process. I am not gonna play anything. We're just gonna to listen through this song. We're not gonna learn the whole thing, but we'll listen through a fair bit of it. You let me know in the comments, what key is this in? And how did you find that information? How did you find that information? Let me know how you came to the conclusion that you did, but let me know in the comments, what key are we in? So I'm hearing right away, a long intro with a riff. The riff is the same as the verse. Same as the verse. Little variations there. We have another verse, it's the same deal. It's moving up and down. We've got some answers coming here. Lots of folks saying G sharp or A flat, for sure. So we have the same riff for our verse and for our chorus. Sorry, for our verse and our riffs in between. What's going on with the chorus? Okay, so there's our chorus. We haven't changed key or anything. But what else have we got? We've got a bit of a feel change, a time feel change. It goes from straight swing. That's kind of interesting. There are two chords going on here. I'm not gonna work out what those chords are. We'll get to that. Now, what I'd be doing 
while I was doing this. I didn't want to play for you guys. I wanted you to do this. I would have been sat working out, first of all, what key the song is in, if there are any big chord movements from section to section, and I'd be looking for those. So we've got some comments. Most of you, in fact, I think all of you were correct here. You've come out with G, I guess that was G sharp, uh, or A flat for sure. Uh, who else do we have? Cranky Lola says, why don't you make your whammy bar scream? I don't have one, um, <laughs> but we'll get to that. Uh, PJ, she has a great voice. She does indeed. She's a delight to work with as well. Uh, a flat minor, G sharp, same deal. G sharp, uh, G sharp, uh, A flat may, uh, minor from watching me play. G sharp Dorian, yeah, superb. That's what I'd improvise now over. That's what I did in the intro. G sharp minor, okay, killer. So we've all agreed it's in G sharp minor. This tells us a couple of things. First of all, it tells us that we're going to be kind of picking from the notes of G-sharp minor when we come to learn our song. So that kind of eliminates a good amount of potential information that we could be looking at. We're probably not going to be playing a great number of A's, for example. Unless we've got some frigid action going on, we'll figure that out. We're probably not going to be playing a huge number of D naturals, but we'll be playing a good number of D sharps. Uh, let's say, let's assume it's G sharp minor, uh, D sharps, C sharps, etc. The next thing we need to figure out is what's going on with that riff, because there's a big portion of that there that I think is made up of that riff. Now, this is going to be a subject, a subject that I might refer to as moving the big rocks or a topic I might refer to as moving the big rocks. So when we move the big rocks, we might think about it as trying to get the big picture version of the song, i.e., if we were asked to sit and busk this song, and let's say, for example, the singer came along and went, oh, I, I want to sing this song. This is Lydia. She wants to come along and sing this song. Can you just play the song? It doesn't have to be perfect, but just play something so I can sing this song for whoever it is that happens to be watching. Uh, you know, Ronnie Dio has decided to uh, return from the grave and take a listen, and you've got 10 minutes with him, and he wants to hear Pyre, and you are the only person who can make this happen. How would you learn this in the shortest period of time? Well, you would move the big rocks. You'd go, okay, well, it's A flat for mo or G sharp, whatever it is, for most of the verse. Are there any chord changes? Let's go digging. And the way we do this is just by playing some root notes. So we play some root notes. There's a G sharp. Let's go back to the very beginning. Very beginning. Here we go. Let's go back to our Songmaster Pro. Okay, there's my G sharp. I'm gonna go to this camera. Ooh, there's several me's. There we go. This camera. So, no changes just yet. This is what I'd be doing while I was listening to this song. Listening out for changes. Oh, that's a fun little figure. I'll make a note of that. I need to figure that out later. While I'm here, I'm also going to figure out which G sharp this riff is on. Notice I haven't stopped the song yet. I'm listening all the way through this. That feels like that's where the riff is. Okay. Still on G sharp. And we've got a chord change here. It's not there. Let's bring it back. Now, as far as dissecting these chord changes, there's a chord change there. What I might do here is I might just bluster through this. And I probably would, in fact. I'd probably just, like, uh, if it were me, probably just, bre oh, that's two mates, breeze on through the thing. I would just rattle on and play through the whole thing. But I'm going to show you the process of decoding this. So I know that we're in G sharp minor. I know I have several options for which chord it could be. Could be G sharp. Could be F sharp. Could be uh, a C sharp. Could be uh, E, ooh, that's an awkward one. <laughs> could be a B natural, what else could it be? Could be D sharp. How do I know those are my options? I know those are my options from the fact that I've played a whole bunch of songs in minor keys, and I know that that G sharp has these chords orbiting around it. It's worth learning a bit of music theory for this, but if you've played enough songs, you probably know that that's kind of kind of what your options are. So I'm going to assume it's one of those chords and I've already eliminated the fact that it's not going to be this one because I played it and it felt wrong. So we get this. Yeah, it's 
sounds okay, but that's not it. So let's try another. Let's go like this. Bring it back. Go back to the beginning of that section. There it is. Okay. I'm going to go again and see if I can figure out what the next change is. I'm going to guess it's the same thing again. All right. So that's working for us. So we've established, we've established that we have a riff which is revolving around this G sharp. We've got two chords in the chorus. I'm going to work on the assumption that it's the same for every riff and the same for every chorus. Let's carry on listening. Okay, that's working for me. I don't mind having the noodle while I'm doing this. And I've got that thing going on. Stuff's going on in between. That seems fairly familiar. Okay, chorus is coming up. And I happen to know that the chorus has this G sharp minor and this F sharp in it. All right. Does it change? Let's find out. And then we go back here. Yep, that's right. Very nice. And back again. Okay, cool. So we've made some connections here. We've now not just have a vision of the song, and because we're listening to it the whole time, we're not just building up this, uh, we're building up this really cool mental picture of what the song is supposed to sound like. We've also established that the riff kind of revolves around this note here. I had a little sneaky noodle around, and I figured out that there are some fills using G sharp minor pentatonic. I figured out that rhythm. I don't think that's quite right, but I'll come back to the riff and figure that out in a second. Notice we're not getting lost in the details here. We're just creating a big picture, a big picture of what the song goes like. And this gives me the ability to predict various sections. I get an idea of, okay, what is the, what's the chorus? Is it gonna be these two chords? Yes. What's the riff? It's this one here. Now this leads me to another interesting subject, which is we haven't touched on the tuning of this song yet. We haven't touched on the tuning. Now, I have a little bit of a, an insight into this one because I've, uh, I've done some recording with these guys, produced this track. Uh, I produced several others with them uh, that are coming out quite soon. I happen to know that they don't play in standard tuning. So what tuning are they playing in? Well, let's take an educated guess, right? If we play this, and it's G sharp minor, what tuning do you guys think we're playing in here. What could we be playing in? You let me know, right? You let me know. We're playing G sharp minor and we're playing something resembling A minor pentatonic but down a semitone. Now it sounds to me like the riff doesn't just have this, but it also has this low octave in. So it could be, as William Lee has rightly pointed out, E flat standard tuning. What do we do with that information? Well, got a couple options. We can down tune our guitar, or if you've got Songmaster Pro, you can transpose up the song. So we can transpose this up a semitone to give us this. Without changing the tempo, let's see what that does. I'm gonna loop this section here. So this I'm gonna call the riff. Let's just cycle it up. We can do that. Yeah, that looks pretty good. That's a fun little fill. Okay. Magic. So my options at this point, now we've established that in actual fact, this song is in A, but well, I'm playing as if it's an A, but it's tuned down a semitone. We have the options of either continuing, uh, Jan, Jan Camps says, as soon as I saw G-sharp, I knew it was an A. Sure, man, it's, 
It's rock isms. And that also informs what's going on with these chords. So in my mind, I can continue to play those chords uh, that we worked out, which is this. We, we had this for our chorus. We can now play it as A minor and a big G. Back to A. And there we go. Now, Helmer Strap is in with a question. We're going to answer these questions as we go today, but we are going to do some Q&As at the end too. Uh, we found G sharp as the main chord, but how do you know that is the song key without knowing the other chords? Well, that's an interesting topic. I'm going to turn this open to discussion in the comments as well, but ultimately, there are many functions that the G sharp could have fulfilled. It could have been the third in the key of E, for example. Uh, it could have been a fifth in the key of C sharp, maybe. Um, but what it could also have done is it could have been the root in G sharp. The reason we know it's G sharp as the main chord, the reason we know that's the root is it feels super stable and super at home. It feels like it is super, super settled. If you want some discussion on this, by the way, you want some discussion on this and how to find it. We've got some courses available on uh, licklibrary.com, including, but not limited to, two GI Plus courses that are now available on licklibrary.com that I produced that I think you'll get a kick out of with this one. One of the big ones, which actually teaches you a whole bunch about this stuff, is a course called The Ultimate Guide to Melody and Phrasing. It's a massive course, humongous, like four plus hours in length. But one of the things it talks about is the relative sounds that you get from intervals like a root or a third and how you know when you're hearing a root, how you know when you're hearing a third. And that's kind of an important step. But ultimately, we figured this out in a couple of different ways. We figured it out because the song spends a lot of time there and it feels like it's home. We also figured it out because of the changes that are happening in the chorus. But we also, on top of this, figured it out because there's some riffs using what sounds like the G sharp minor pentatonic scale, which we're going to suss out in a second. So thus far, we've created a big picture image of our song, right? We have this big top down view. What you should probably be able to do, and I'm going to ask you this question now, is earlier on in this stream, I asked you to sing the riff from uh, Smoke in the Water in your head or Seven Nation Army, whatever. Hopefully you were able to do that. Let me know in the comments if you're able to do that. But here's the big question. Here is the big question. Can you now sing the riff in your head? Can you sing the riff from this song that we're learning? This is the song Pyre by the band Crowley. Can you sing this riff in your head? I can. I can hear it in my head and hear it. Fills, 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 fills. It's in there, right? It's in there. Now, this is a song that, admittedly, I've listened to before. You may not have, but by listening to this song over and over again and uh, figuring out the big rocks as we go, figuring out the key... The rhythm, the kind of, uh, is what tuning are we in? What are the chords in the chorus? We've had repeated exposures to, there we are, John Max saying, yes, I can hear the riff. We've had repeated exposures to the more tricky bit, which is the riff. And if we have a clear idea of what it is we're trying to play, you should be able to figure it out a little more easily. So let's figure it out. Cool riff, I'm doing my best Dio impression. So is Lydia. Um, it's a cool, it's a great song, right? They're a great band. Um, I'll, I'll post links later on, but they're really, really cool. Go to Spotify and check it out. William Lee says, I heard it. Sure, right? I can hear it too. So our next step, now that we've got the big picture of the song, is to start to drill down into the details. And how do we do this? We do this through repetition. We do it by listening. Now, we could approach this a few different ways. Uh, we could appreciate, we could approach it from the perspective of, well, let's just learn the riff in isolation. Let's figure out what it is and let's go. We don't want that. It sounds like Black Sabbath mixing with the blues vibe. Yeah, I totally got that that vibe off it. It's a, they're a killer band. Uh, anyway, so I'm um, <laughs> like, there's lots of love for the band. Um, I recorded and mixed this, so I, I like it a lot. Anyway, uh, let's go back to this now. So if we go back to our song, we could sit and we could kind of agonize over this for long periods of time, but our best bet is just to loop it and keep listening out for various notes. 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go on Sunmaster Pro. I'm going to loop up this riff. Now you can do this in your DAW of choice. That's the riff that we're all hearing in our head. I've transposed it into the new key, which is A. Ah, here's one from Mal Riley. You did a show about intervals and the feelings they make. Yeah, so good shout, good shout. Now, we'll link that later. I'm actually going to link up, rip up, loop up rather, just one riff. Now, while I've got this looped up, I'm going to try and figure out what that first little fill is. So I can hear that little movement. What am I looking for? Not there, not there, not there. There it is. That's the note. Is it double stop? It's a double stop. Cool, so now I've got the riff. Yeah, nice, excellent. How did I figure that out? Well, I did some trial and error. I'll be honest with you, I was kind of exaggerating that for comic effect, but you get the gist. I'm feeling around looking for that one note, but all the while still playing the rest of this stuff. Now, I'm also gonna look for this and see how many times this little figure that I've just learned. How many times does it come around? Not that time. And not that time either. So this one's different. Let's loop it. Now, how did I know which notes to get to there? This. Very cool riff. How did I know which notes to pick there? Well. I knew which notes to pick there because it's a minor pentatonic lick, right? There we go. It's a minor pentatonic lick, right? Most people can hear that. Now, how did we know it was minor pentatonic that I was going to pick from? I could have picked all sorts of scales for this. I could have picked a Phrygian dominant. I could have gone all Malmsteen. If I so desired, I could have picked uh, Dorian Sharp 4, I don't know, Hungarian minor, you name it. Adams family, uh, but I didn't pick that. I picked minor pentatonic. How did I know it was minor pentatonic? Because I've been listening to the song for <laughs> blimmin' ages, uh, nearly 15 minutes now, and I've uh, I've heard that minor pentatonic riff over and over again. I've gone, that's minor pentatonic. Also, the first bit I figured out was minor pentatonic. I'm drawing conclusions about this and making predictions about where the song might go. This is an important step for learning songs because we're creating this big view, I keep saying this, but this big picture view of the song, we go, okay, the riffs are minor pentatonic. So it's gonna be maybe, or it'll be, or it'll be. Now, if I said to you, friends, that the riff goes, you can probably figure out what that's gonna go like. You can figure out that the ba boom is going back to the roots. Boop, 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 boom. That's not it. That's not it. That's it. Let's check against the, the backing track. Let's figure it out. Yep, that's the one. What about the last one? Is it the same? Your second one along, this next one. Yeah, that's the same. What about this one? Well, that's a bit more challenging. What am I missing there? Doodle 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 doodle. Did you notice what I did there? When I couldn't figure out what it was, I stopped and I sang it. Stopped and sang the thing. And um, when I stopped and I sang it, there we go. There we go. Um, what can I tell you? This is kind of what we're doing here. So, 
The next step, the next step once we've done this, we have learned our song to a point. We've learned the big picture, we've learned the riffs, we've learned the chords that are going on in the chorus. We can probably play most of the way through this. This is a good point to actually start playing most of the way through the song. You get the gist. Now, uh, let me just close off this little cycle here. We don't want that anymore. Uh, okay, let's go back to the beginning of a song. What we do now is we now exploit a backing track and try playing along with our song and see if we can get the gist of it. Now, what we can do here is we can play along with the original performance. We can also, thanks to the, uh, the app that we're using, we can play without the guitar. So I can take the guitar away. Now, there is no, uh, unfortunately, there is no uh, drums in the intro. So maybe I'll throw a metronome on. Maybe I'll put my metronome on here. Let's see what that's like. Let's put the metronome on. Bless her heart. Transpose Lydia, but uh, she'll kill me for this, but that's fine. Uh, so what I might do is I might throw a metronome on and see if I can play along with the song and see if I can catch as much of it as I can. If I make mistakes, at this point, I'm not going to stop. I'm just going to bluster through. So the metronome up. And I know I haven't got that bit, but I'm going to come back to it. And there I'm going to just throw some bills. And I know this isn't right, but it's enough for me to get through the thing. If there's any bits that are quite easy, like slamming these chords, I might just improvise. I might just improvise and just like find something that keeps me engaged while I'm listening to the rest of the song. I'm pretty confident that I got quite a lot of that, but there was a little bit right in the beginning that I know I didn't get. And this is where I probably start getting in and filling in these little details, if that makes sense. So maybe this little section here. It was that boop, boop. What's actually going on here? Now here I might solo the guitar. <laughs> Ah, there's a little bit, bop, bop, bop. Let's figure out what that is. Okay, three chords, one of them is repeated. Boop, 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 boop. That's not it. That last one's wrong. Ah, there it is. Uh, Okay, with that in mind, I could probably play the whole intro, so let's so start out. Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, from the beginning, let's go play, please. Well, I've got a section cycled up that's not a section. Uh, I need to figure out how to get rid of that cycle. Uh, auto, uh, let's do that. Let's get rid of the guitar, actually. I know it's coming up here. Yeah, okay, there we go. So I know that that's, uh, that's what's coming there. Already sound has been kind enough to stop that for me. This, friends, is the process that we use. Now, I'm gonna simplify this because you've sat and watched me learn this song, but this is how I would go about learning songs. What you'll notice is that I spend as much of my time as humanly possible playing along with the song. 
even if I don't know a bit of the song, I'll just jam it out. There were some fills that I didn't know at all there, like this. I don't know what on earth that fill was. There's a fill in there, I don't know. I don't know what it goes like. I'm just going to jam it. I'm going to fill something in. The point with this is at no point here am I getting lost in the minutiae. I'm not getting stuck in these tiny details of, ooh, stop the song. I've got to learn that four chord. Bomp, 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 bomp. There's a lot of the mentality of, right, I'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. I just want to get through the whole thing. So our objective is less like... I guess here's a fun way of, uh, of analogizing it. Learning songs is less like revealing a map on a video game where you start on one small spot and you explore it a small step at a time and much more like doing a jigsaw puzzle in that you start with the edges. Start with the edges and then fill in the information from there on. Find all the edges, get the end of it get the lines all put together, get an idea of what it's supposed to look like, reference the box. What is this picture of a Pomeranian that I'm supposed to be putting together in this jigsaw puzzle? It's a lot more like that than it is like unveiling a map on a, uh, I don't know, a strategy game or something like that, whatever. So that, friends, is kind of how I go about learning songs. We start with the big picture. We get a mental image of what the riffs and the songs and the changes are supposed to sound like. We then start to drill into the details as and when we need them, as and when we need them. So like that little bomb, 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 these little arrangement touches, I make mental notes of that and go on, right, I need to learn that, but I'll get back to that. This is a much quicker, much more efficient way to learn a song than it is to go bar by bar with a piece of tab, right? What we also get here is we get an idea of how, you know, do the sections repeat? Is that riff something that just goes throughout? How many times does it go throughout? Does it change? Does it change key? Is there anything, anything I need to be aware of? Or is it something relatively simple? Who knows? So that, friends, is the process of learning songs. If you want to further expedite your song learning process, the best way you can do it is not by grabbing the uh, numbers on an Excel spreadsheet, but instead, Go get taught the song by a person who has done this uh, process ahead of time and is able to communicate this song to you in real time. Now, that process I've done is the quickest possible way, I think, and most efficient possible way of learning a song where there are no lessons available. But it's much quicker if I just taught you the song. So if I'd gone like this, let's say, if I go, uh, I'm going to teach you it now real quick. So the riff is going to go like this. It's... We're in, e uh, we're in E flat tuning, but it doesn't really matter. We're going to play on fret number seven on the D string. We'll play that a couple of times. We'll go. We're going to hammer on from five to seven to get. While we're playing that, we're also going to play the open A string. We're going to play that riff three times, followed by a fill. The first fill is going to go like this. It'll go five, seven, with a hammer on, pick seven again, and then double stop on five and five on the G and B strings. So we get this. Right? How quick was that? But it's way quicker than learning the song by ear. This is the merits of being taught the song. So much faster than uh, doing it by tab. Faster again than doing it by ear. The tab is cool too. The tab is important. Don't get me wrong. Tab is useful. But this sort of process of learning, way more important. We also made observations about the song. We knew what the chorus was. We knew what the riff went like. We were able to sing it in our heads. We were able to improvise around the riff because we know the sort of vocabulary the riff used, etc. If somebody said, hey, you need to take a solo in the middle of this song, you'd know what to do. There you go. That's been my advice on learning songs. It's been a cool uh, lesson and we're going to do some Q&A. So just a quick reminder, today uh, this lesson has been brought to you by Songmaster Pro by Orally Sound. We've got some questions coming in. I want to know what questions you have, dear friends, and we've got time to answer them. So let's get into it with the Q&A. Oh, good timing. Well done, me. Um, 
I always mess that up, and I didn't today. Uh, today I learned that I'm checking out the band Crowley. You should check out the band Crowley. You've all seen Eliza on Lick Library social media um, doing the rundowns of the courses that we've been putting out. This is Eliza's band. She's playing guitar on this, right? So go check her out. She's a member of the Lick Library family, as are uh, all of your friends watching today. Uh, so we've got some great questions coming in. I am going to answer as many as, as many of them as I can. Uh, Block 18 says, Nick, will the app be able to tune fractions of a tone for tunes like Beat It, where they sped up the master? 100% can. I'll show you this real quick here. Uh, I'm going to hide the question, but if you take a look over here on Tools, where it says uh, Transpose, here I'm transposing... Keep your eyes on the bottom left hand corner. Here I'm transposing by semitones. We can also do cents. We could even do octaves if we wanted to. We're not going to do that. Um, so yeah, you can do it by cents. You can do it by fractions. This is great if you're uh, a guitar teacher, by the way. Uh, <laughs> if you're a guitar teacher and you've ever wanted to teach back in, uh, sorry, back in black, highway to hell, which is this guy. <laughs> Fun song, right? It's a great song. It's part of Guitar Vocabulary 101. This was part of the uh, syllabus for a guitar course that I used to teach. It's not a course that I made. Uh, it was a franchise course. Um, it was to do with the Yamaha School of Music. This was on the syllabus. Uh, and they had a backing track for it. The backing track was really cheesy. Um, so I would try and play along with the original. Little did I know that the original is not in standard tuning. And I had like... <laughs> don't know like a dozens of young guitar players playing something to the equivalent of uh let me see if i can figure this out but an awful way to play this to the equivalent of because it's not in standard tuning it was grim uh so yeah you can do something like that uh from what i remember the album that highway to hell is from uh has something like seven songs in the key of a and they're all different a's because they just tuned to angus like angus tuned his guitar and he went right lads here's a everyone tuned to that uh lots of songs from the uh before the advent of digital guitar tuners had that sort of deal going on here is a cool question from our friend marcine uh music production question what is mastering well Mastering is often portrayed as a dark art, but let's get into it. Any production nerds here? Let me know in the comments. Um, ultimately, what mastering is, is you might think about it as the final stage of quality checking before a mix gets let out into the world. So let's analogize for a moment. The uh, recording process begins with writing and pre-production, which is where you figure out what is this song going to be like? How long is it going to be? What are the lyrics? What are the riffs go like? What instruments are we going to need? Should we drop this part in here? Should we drop it out there? The arranging process, the recording process, that all happens in the rehearsal room. Anybody who's been in a band and written songs, you know what that's all about. Recording is the next stage of the process where you get yourself in the studio or you get yourself into uh, around your mate's house with a Scarlet 2i2. Nothing wrong with that. I think uh, it's the new punk is a recording with uh, the old Scarlet 2i2. Dave Grohl said that uh, digital is the man and uh, tape is punk, to which I responded, have you seen how much tape costs? He didn't hear because he was on the TV. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> yes, digital is, uh, is the new punk. Um, and I will hear no argument on this, DIY. Uh, anyway, the recording process, you record all your parts. The next bit that we're familiar with is mixing. And mixing is where we try and get not only the elements sounding great, where we make the drums nice and big and the guitars nice and big and bold. A big part of this is the recording process too. But we also get all of the elements to sit together and work cohesively in a song. So I'm going to show you an example of this, uh, what the function of mixing might be with the L. Crowley song that we've got going on here. I want you to pay attention to the, if you can hear it, the reverb on the guitar. There's reverb on this guitar, but only in the intro. Well, that's just the vocal. <laughs> the vocal's killer, but we don't want just the vocal. Let's uh, get the whole song back in. There's reverb on this guitar. You'll notice that it's not exactly on the metronome either, because who cares? It's rock and roll. Reverb on the guitar is gone. No more reverb. Because it was getting a bit swampy. It was just there in the intro to give it some space. Now let's do another example here. If we go... Listen to what happens to the guitars in the verse. Listen to how loud they are here. Dug down and make space for the vocal. Prop back up in the gaps. Back up, down. 
back up, etc. Things like that are mixing. This is getting the song to work together. Um, that's an example of automation mixing. Once you've finished a mix, once you finish the mix, then it's time to go to mastering. And mastering is like the final quality coat. Now, if the mix is good, the mastering engineer shouldn't have to do a whole lot. But what the mastering engineer's job is to do is not just to take a listen to the mix and make it great, but they have to make it suitable for playback on whatever system it happens to be getting played back on. So if it's going to a vinyl record, for example, it's going to a vinyl record, it needs to be mastered a particular way. If it's going to streaming, it needs to be mastered a particular way. But you also need to make sure that it's gonna sound good on as many devices as possible. Will it sound great on uh, Jonathan Graham's unbelievable home stereo system? Yes. Will it sound great on the uh, black box of misery held this way so it's mono? Yes. Will it sound great on a set of, uh, oh, I've got them here, on a set of the old white earbuds? Yes. Will it sound great on an expensive set of reference headphones? Yes. Will it sound great in my car? Yes. The way we do this is by making sure that it matches certain dynamic and frequency uh, targets for mixes in its genre. We also have to make sure that it stands up to other mixes in its genre because we assume that, for example, folks uh, listening to rock stuff will also potentially listen to Crowley. So we have to make sure that it's not super dark by comparison or super bright or super quiet or super um, super loud. We have to make sure that it sits alongside of the releases of the same genre. Notice at no point here are we going, we need to make sure the drums sound good. The point of mastering is to take a good sounding mix and make sure it translates onto as many systems as possible. And that includes, but is not limited to, making it geet loud. So here's another great question uh, from our friend Ryan Fitzgerald. Oh, what kind of car do you drive, Nick? I drive an old man's Jag, is what I drive. Uh, and not a cool one. Uh, it's an X-Type Estate 2.2 turbo diesel. It's a good musician's car. Uh, efficient, comfortable, um, and you can get loads of gear in the back. And if it breaks... I'm not going to be super upset because it wasn't very expensive. Uh, anyway, hey Nick, uh, I was wondering if you had any recommendations in dealing with tight forearms or tight muscles from working out and playing the guitar. This is a great, great question because indeed I do. Uh, this is one of those things that um, we have to contend with, those of us who are gym rats and also guitar players, because uh, we are putting lots of demands on the muscles of our hands. Now, uh, well, the muscles that move our hands, um, the intrinsic and extrinsic muscles of the hand. Thanks, Jordan Feigenbaum. Uh, anyway, um, a couple of ways we can think about this. So, as you guys potentially know, uh, if you're our GI Plus subscribers, you'll know that I'm a competitive powerlifter in addition to being a guitar player. There is a medal that is for doing the picking up and putting down of weights. Um, I came third, it was great, from the last meet. Hoping for a better medal this time around. <laughs> you know, so I love that medal, it's my first medal. Anyway, um, so, a couple of things. First of all, uh, one thing that I can recommend is to consider modifying your training in ways that, consider modifying your training where appropriate. So examples of this are, if I have a gig on, let's say I have gigs Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm not gonna be doing competition style deadlift where I'm not allowed to use straps uh, and I have to use my hook grip. I'm not gonna be doing that on the Friday morning before the gig. I'm gonna put that earlier in the week to give my hands a little bit of time to recover before it's time for the gig. So exercise order. I will also, if I'm doing my secondary deadlift, which might be going along with maybe a pull session. So maybe I'll do my secondary deadlift and I'll do some uh, back work, let's say. Um, what I might do there is I might make sure I'm wearing straps or using something like Versa Grips for the majority of the session. Uh, this is all the training aspect of it. So what we're doing here ultimately is we're doing the things that you do with all things in training, which is we're modifying the dose and the formulation of your training. We're modifying the exercise selection and the amount of it and the intensity of it to mitigate fatigue. Now, if hand fatigue wasn't an issue, grab all the things, pull them as hard as you want. But what I'm doing here is I'm structuring my training in such a way that when I need, need, need to be able to play, I'm not putting excessive stress on my hands. However, there is another thing with this where um, I think personally, uh, a lot of the soreness and stiffness uh, that we're talking about here, these tight forearms, tight muscles, 
can often be the result uh, of a combination of training volume and playing exposure, the amount of playing you're doing, that you're not adapted to at the current time. So this means that either the training is perhaps a little too much, or maybe the training is appropriate, but that amount of training and playing is more than you can handle right now. The way to get around this is to expose yourself gradually to more training and more playing. So the way we deal with this is when you've trained, you practice. And what I mean by practice is just get the hands moving. What I'll say with this is there aren't any magic remedies to this. There aren't any, there, there are no oils or supplements or any of this stuff I can recommend to you that will magically solve this issue, but, uh, it's really a dose uh, issue, I think, dose and formulation. So organize your training so that when you really, really, really need your hands to be fresh, they're fresh. It's a good time to go and do some uh, lower body training, for example. Um, although for me, a lot of lower body training involves low bar squats, which puts a lot of pressure on the wrists, but that's fine, I wear wrist wraps because you guessed it, beats my hands up. Um, so yeah, great question. I would love to address that probably in another stream, uh, but it's a very, very good one. Hopefully that's a little bit of an answer for you. Uh, we've got a few other questions coming in. I want to answer a few of these, as many as we can. Um, oh, we never got to the bottom of this. Uh, Floyd Rose Trem or PRS Tremolo. I've said, uh, Floyd Rose Trem. Even though I love PRS, I've said Floyd Rose Trem. Um, so anyway, uh, guys, unfortunately, we've run out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming on board. Uh, Soundmaster Pro have uh, already sound. Soundmaster Pro, the sponsor of today's stream. But also, let's not forget, this stream has been brought to you by Lick Library. Guitar Interactive Magazine. Go here for lessons. All of the lessons you can possibly imagine. Songs, we got hundreds of them. One-to-one -one less lessons, we do them. Uh, technique lessons, we have... Uh, Theory, improvisation, blues licks, rock licks, whatever you could possibly want from a guitar lesson, we've got it. We've got uh, Tom Quayle and Rick Graham and Sam Bell uh, and uh, Andy Wood and Andy James and Giorgio Secchi and Michael Caswell and uh, endless others. You name it, they've probably done lessons for Lick Library. Uh, so yes, I'm going to leave you with that. Go here. Guitar Interactive Magazine, for interviews, reviews, news, and all of that other guitar stuff that we love. My name is Nick Jennison for Lick Library, Guitar Interactive, and today, I really Sound. This has been the Monday Guitar Show. Thank you so much for joining us. We do this every Monday. Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon so we can let you know when we're about to go live. We're back next week with another stream on a different subject. Today, we've been talking about learning songs. Who knows what it's going to be next week? Can't possibly tell you. But for the time being, I'm going to play along with some more Crowley. I'm going to mute poor Lydia, and I'm just going to jam away on this song that I know so well now. This has been a lesson brought to you by Hourly Sound, Songmaster Pro. My name is Nick Jennison. I will see you guys next time. That's not the button that plays it. This is the button that plays it. <laughs> My name is Nick Jennison and it's my pleasure to announce that GI Plus, the exclusive lessons from Guitar Interactive Magazine, are now included with your Lick Library membership. GI Plus features a whole host of the best players and educators in the world, bringing you exclusive lessons on everything from metal to blues to fusion and everything in between. Want to level up your shred chops? Check out How to Play Fast by Andy James. Or how about sweet picking with Rick Graham? Or maybe country's more your bag? Well, how about a full length country guitar course from Andy Wood? <laughs> 
Interested in learning how to play over changes? Well, members get access to hours of exclusive lessons from fusion maestro Tom Quayle. Or maybe you want your playing to sound more soulful. Well, who better than Chris Buck to show you how it's done? Members also get access to every lesson ever published in Guitar Interactive magazine, including Michael Caswell's legendary Pro Concepts column. Or maybe you want to learn the secrets of the masters. Well, members get access to over 70 full-length tech sessions, where our tutors painstakingly decode the styles of players like David Gilmore, Eddie Van Halen, John Petrucci, Larry Carlton, Slash, Tom Sinabasi, Paul Gilbert, and many more. And you get all of this in addition to all of the amazing content on LickLibrary.com, which includes note-for-note -note tuition of over 60 classic albums, weekly lesson uploads, a backing track library, and one-to-one -one player support. There has never been a better time to sign up than right now.